It's 9 p.m. in the South Korean capital, Seoul. At a subway station, we've arranged a meeting. This 25-year-old is North Korean. He's asked us not to reveal his face or his name, but he wants to tell us about his past. This is the story of the defectors, men and women who've escaped North Korea. The testimony you will hear in this program is shocking, it's heartbreaking, and it's happening right now. Stories of murder, slavery, torture, imprisonment, rape. Unparalleled in the modern world and recalled by those who survived it. Driving through the neon of modern Seoul, just 30 miles from the darkness of North Korea, the 25-year-old we've met can't quite believe he's here or even that he's alive. The miracle is this new beginning after a childhood spent in a North Korean labor camp. We arrive at the Seoul apartment block that's now his home. This is the place he's describing. North Korea is one of the world's poorest countries, a closed nation, a people cut off. Communal farms, it's all from a different age. But away from here, out of sight are the gulags, the political prisons, modern-day concentration camps. Satellite images show their scale, but for a picture of what they're really like, we can only rely on those who've been there. These sketches are the recollections of other prisoners who've managed to escape the camps. He's not seen them, but just listen to how his descriptions match. Listening to all this from the bedroom is his mother. The two escaped the north separately. Remarkably, they were reunited in Seoul. She's never told her own story, and for now she says she can't. It's Sunday morning. On the sixth floor of an unassuming building, a community of Christians have gathered for their weekly service. Most of the congregation are South Korean. But dotted among them are men, women and children from the north. There are about 25,000 North Koreans living in the South. All of them are defectors. They've managed to escape. You only have to talk to someone from the North for a minute or two for a hint of their past life. 
And Jae Yong arrived here in 2004. In the 1990s, his eldest brother defected to Russia. That was effectively a death sentence for the rest of the family. They were all punished for the brother's crime. The South Korean capital is modern and it's sophisticated. It feels a million miles from North Korea. And yet here, we're just a hundred miles from the North Korean capital. But between the two countries is this, the DMZ, a border and a buffer, a place where there are more landmines than anywhere else on Earth. It is impenetrable. And so all those who do manage the escape, 2,000 or so a year, must endure an extraordinary journey. Their goal is the South Korean capital Seoul, a place where they're granted freedom. With no chance of crossing this border though, all of them head north to China. There they cross the Tumen River, which forms the country's northern border. In winter, it's easier, the river's frozen. From there they must survive undetected as they travel through China, if caught, the Chinese send them straight home. Their objective then is Southeast Asia, the South Korean embassy in Vietnam, Laos or Thailand. There they'll be granted their freedom, a passport and a flight to Seoul. Chirazu Park made that journey in 2012. He's a former tank commander in the North Korean army. Three years ago, he was here, in the North Korean capital Pyongyang, driving a tank in Kim Jong-un's parade. We meet him at the War Museum in Seoul. And as we look at one of the ancient tanks, just like those he was driving only a couple of years ago, he tells me that it was only when he was brought to this museum that he realized all he knew, all that he'd been taught in the North, was a lie. The Korean War in 1950 wasn't started by the South and the Americans. It was the North who invaded the South, and that strong army he thought he served in is nothing. <laughs> He seems almost lost in his new life. He's cautious too, and not yet comfortable about discussing the details of his escape, why and how he did it. It involves his family. He'll talk about it later, he says, in private. In the hills outside Seoul is a place called Hanawan. This secret facility, off limits to us, is where rehabilitation for every defector begins. All the North Koreans in the South have spent time here. They are effectively reprogrammed. History is rewritten, corrected, and they're taught from scratch. Even the things we take for granted, how to drive, how to buy a coffee, how to fit in. But the challenges even after the rehab at Hanawan are huge. As a North Korean, fitting in anywhere is hard. Mr. Ahn from the church is to show us how sport helps him. We return to the home of the young man whose childhood was spent in a prison camp. His mother has decided she wants to tell us her story. 
and North Korea's ambassador to the UK grants Sky News a rare interview. We don't have labor camps. This is a TV show with a difference. It's not a place you'd expect to find North Korean defectors struggling with their new South Korean lives. But that's precisely who these women are. It's part chat show, part talent contest. South Korean TV personalities laugh with North Korean contestants. <laughs> Here they impersonate newsreaders from the north. It prompts a nervous smile. There's a laugh when one young woman admits she can drive a tank. An emotion as others discuss kidnappings in the north. But it is quickly clear the laughs hide an enduring struggle. This is Lee shun Shiel, free now, but still utterly broken behind the smiling. She was once a North Korean soldier. She bears the scars of torture. She tried to escape nine times. She and her two-year-old daughter finally made it over the border to China. But there, the misery continued. She and her baby were sold in China and to different people. Mrs. Lee was forced into farm labor. She's no idea where her daughter went. It's hard to listen to. <laughs> Anjay Yong is the defector we met at church. He's asked us to join him for a game of choku. It's a curious, impressive mix of football with volleyball. We're in a downtrodden suburb of Seoul. The game allows us a moment to understand one of the many difficulties for North Koreans in the South, integration. Ah, South Korea. North Korea, OK. Who's winning? There are effectively two games here. On this pitch, the players are from the North. But down there, on the other, are the South Korean players. Two nations alongside each other, but not yet together. Moon Yong Suk was at the church too. I sense he's struggling. The 2,000 or so people who make the escape to Seoul every year are treated with remarkable generosity by the South Korean government. Because this peninsula was once one nation, those from the north are automatically granted South Korean citizenship. With that comes counselling, housing and cash to get them going. But there's a sense that this causes resentment, friction with some from the south. These men are treated as a lower class. Still, it's better than the north. <laughs> By evening, we're back in the city centre and back with the young man who'd spent his childhood in a prison camp. He wants us to return to his home. His mother has made a decision. She wants to talk. The following morning, we're heading back. She's decided that for the first time, she wants to reveal her life in a North Korean prison camp. 
이 세상에 알려야 되는 이런 못다한 일이 많은 사람이야 그래서 나는 들어가서 그 모진 고문 모진 아픈 매를 다 맞거든 내가 이제 석 벗기는 동시에 앞을 잠깐 이렇게 봤는데 끝이 없는 쫙 그래서 이런 현관처럼 복도인데 벽 쪽에 쫙 이렇게 자그마한 철문들이 다다다다다 이렇게 요만한 간격을 붙은 거 보니까 그게 바로 그 제수들 들어가는 그 감방이더라고. 감방 자체가 사람이 키로 된 감방이 아니고 사람이 앉으면 약간 이렇게 공간이 이렇게 그래서 이렇게 개 나가고 개 들어오고 개 구멍처럼 그렇게 했는데 내가 다른 감방 형태는 몰라 내가 있던 감방은 그래서 내가 딱 하나만 이렇게 앉아서 요만한 깔개를 하나 주고 그 옆에 오줌똥을 이렇게 사고 막 피자국이 턱 이렇게 She lived like this for two years. She counted the days on the wall in blood. 내리고길 하나씩 주는 거예요. 다 빠지기 시작하니까 제일 바쁘던 게 엉덩이 살려 꼬리뼈가 살이 다 빠지고 꼬리뼈가 더 길어지게 하니까 그 꼬리뼈가 콘크리트에 이렇게 대화 가지고 거기 이제 이렇게 지물에 피에 이렇게 나가지 거기 자꾸 전염되면 이렇게 헐게 되면 이제 허는 거 이게 구창에 있는 게 썩어 들어가면 이렇게 해서 이거 못 들고 All this for being caught trying to escape her country. 그렇게 하니까 이 머리채를 그때 이렇게 이런데 머리채 이렇게 감아 가지고 저 책상 모서리에 짓더라고. 짐승보다 더더 악랄해요. 짐승보다 사람이 사람을 어떻게 그렇게. Hyun Hak Bong is North Korea's ambassador to the UK. He represents the North Korean government and its policies, and he agreed to a rare interview with us. Well, those guys who made the wrong against the government, you know, needs to be punished. But we don't have labor camps. Actually, we have education camps, all right? Not camps, the education place. It is a denial repeated again and again by North Korea. Western countries say that we have a labor camps, but that is not true. A United Nations report released in February concluded beyond doubt that the camps exist. Systematic, widespread and gross human rights violations have been and are being committed by North Korea, it said. And the gravity, scale and nature of these violations reveal a state that does not have any parallel in the contemporary world. Unspeakable atrocities. But we've heard from witnesses who are willing to speak and to recall their hell. Their words provide a unique record. It's time for lunch with Chozu Park, the tank commander from the north. At the museum, he didn't discuss how or why he escaped. Now, at this quiet Korean restaurant, he will. 그날 일이 안 되려니까 그날 백공구 연합지 위해서 나와가지고 그걸 단속 되게 된 동기로 해서 고향을 떠나게 됐습니다. 그 걔네들한테 걸리게 되면 한국 영화나 미국 영화나 이런 영화를 보다가 현장에서 들키는 경우에는 정치범으로 가고. But here's the tragedy. His wife and his children are still in the north. His calculation was that they'd be safer if he left. It's a gamble. 그렇죠. 가족이 보고프고 부립고 뭐 취조를 하거나 잡아가거나 이런 건 없고 지금 상태에선 감시만 하고 있는 걸로 알고 있습니다. We spent a few days inside North Korea last year. It was a strange trip. We were only allowed to see what our minders showed us. I've never seen so many people so devoted to one man. The devotion is quite extraordinary. Hard to understand, hard to explain. 
But Mr. Park says it's simple. 그게 존경하고 사랑해서가 아니고 내가 그 거기서 눈물을 흘려야 될 때는 눈물을 흘려야 되고 외쳐야 될 때는 외치지 않으면 정치적 감투를 씌우고. It is an irony that those who remain inside North Korea carry broad smiles, and yet so many of those who've escaped struggle to smile at all. Mrs. Chon is unlikely ever to heal. The tears are for her lost husband. If he's not dead, he's certainly in a prison camp. And that's the thing. The hell everyone has described here isn't history. It's happening right now in camps just across the border in North Korea.